If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. That's where we're, our message is going to be from this morning. It felt like tonight, so dark outside. I wanted to say tonight. This morning. And the, the focus of our message is that we're going to talk about the why behind our worship and obedience. So Romans 12, 1 through 2, and it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Father God, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you that uh, it works in our hearts and minds. We pray, Lord, that we would be transformed, that we would leave here on fire for you, growing in our relationship with you, and ready to go share the same hope that we have in Jesus with others around us. Amen. All right, these are verses that we just read. We're among the most popular verses in all the Bible. They're, people know them, they memorize them. Um, and in these verses, we see the why behind what we do as believers. And then we also see, as a result of that why, this is how we respond to that why. And that's how our message is going to be divided into two main points. The first being the why behind what we do, and then the response to the why. And uh, it's important because we need to know why we do things, right? It gives us direction. It gives us focus. If we don't know why we do what we do, we wander around aimlessly, visionless, and often, oftentimes we're inefficient and, and waste our time. Uh, but it's important to know and understand why we do things. It's one of the most basic things even kids understand, right? If you've raised kids, oftentimes they go through this phase of asking why 50 times a day until it drives you absolutely crazy. And it even works until they're, they're teenage years too. They kind of ask why, right? It's, it's important to understand, right? They're developing, they're growing. We often have that, had that same situation and ask why. It gives us direction, gives us purpose, and uh, helps us with, with our development and direction. And, uh, you know, I've, I've served in um, ministry for about 15 years, and eight of it I served as a children's pastor. And uh, I'd always be up in front of the kids and all the time we'd have kids that would raise their hand and they just, they wouldn't, you know, until you give them, they're going to have their hand raised the whole entire time until you choose them. And then they ask why, the deep and profound question, why? So then you try to, you know, it's great. You want kids asking, you want them in focus, you want them involved, you want them um, asking questions about God and the Bible. It's great. And so you try to answer those questions the best that you can until they're satisfied. But there's always that one kid who asked why like 12 times in a row without taking a breath. And so you're sitting up there, you're trying to answer those questions, and you're, you're beginning to wonder, you know, like, are, are they messing with me? Or is it legit? Are they legit curious? And so you chase those rabbit trails, you answer the questions why the best that you can, and then you begin to look around, you see the entire room of kids have lost focus, and they're jumping off the walls, they're just, you lost them. And so, you, so then you just kindly tell the student, you tell them, hey, ask me after class. And the hope is that they forgot why they were asking why. You know, as you kind of get to that point, you're like, okay, we can get past that. But then you try to reel them, everybody back in. But knowing the answer to why we do what we do helps give us direction, right? It helps uh, bring clarity to what we're doing. Simply put, knowing why gives us purpose and vision. So in Paul's letter, to the Romans, uh, he gave a clear explanation as to why we do what we do as believers. And then as a result of knowing that why, he goes on and he explains that we respond with worship and obedience to God. So we look at these uh, first 11 chapters of Romans and it focuses in on the why. The verses we read in Romans 12, 1 through 2 are the turning point for the rest of the book. So in, verses, in chapters 12 through 16, the focus goes to the response to the why. So as we look at this first part of Romans 12, 1, it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. And when I was in, a, in seminary, the professors always said 
they uh, emphasize the word therefore. Whenever you came across the word therefore, you always ask yourself, what is it therefore? And so oftentimes that word therefore is a, is a connecting word. So what's about to be said after the word therefore is, comes as a result of what was just previously said. So this is a big therefore, a turning point in the book right here in Romans 12. So everything that Paul is going to say from verses 12, or chapters 12 through 14 or 16 come as a result of what he's already done in chapters 1 through 11. And I think also it's, it's important to notice that if you look at the 13 books that Paul is to have known to, been, to have written, he's responsible for, he almost always starts off with theological truth at the beginning of the book. He starts off, he, you know, he rarely goes on and, and starts the book off with listing off things that we should be doing, you know, exhortations or commands. He rarely starts that way. But he first motivates our faith of the believers, right? That he, he focuses in on the reason why. And as you're reading these letters, he goes on and explains the theological truths behind God's grace, behind his mercy, the truths behind the uh, salvation that he offers to us through faith in Jesus. And then it's because of these truths that we go on and we live on purpose for God. Then he gives those commands. This is how we should live as a result of knowing these theological truths. And knowing these, knowing these theological truths, knowing the why, um, is, it's important because it's easy for us to get into legalism, right? To become legalistic. So often we focus on trying to follow the rules to faith, the do's, the don'ts, be ethical. And if you don't have those deep theological roots, you don't have the understanding, and you don't have that relationship with Jesus based on faith, legalism sets in and we miss out on the whole point of the gospel. That's where people get confused and think, as long as I'm good enough, I can get to heaven. Or as long as my good outweighs my bad, because they look at all the commands, the things they should be doing, rather than the why behind what we do. And I think over the years what's happened is in our teaching sometimes, we focus in on being practical more than we focus in on the theology because the theology can be kind of intimidating. You know, it's, it's something that maybe goes over our heads sometimes. And so we want to bypass that and get into this is what we should do because it's practical. You can go and do it and put it into practice right away. But that comes second after we have that relationship, after we focus in on the why behind what we do. It's important to focus in on that. So in considering the why we do what we do, uh, we're going to look at the, uh, the 11 chapters leading up to I'm not going to go through all 11 chapters. I'm going to go give a little bit of a summary. Um, but in this first three and a half chapters of Romans, we see that God is talking about um, the human condition, right? Mankind and our sinfulness. He explained that we, that we chose the ways of the world rather than choosing the ways of God. And we seek to fulfill our own selfish desires rather than fulfilling the will of God. And then as a result of that, God gave us over to our desires. He gave us over to our depravity. And then Paul continues to explain that it's, it's wide sweeping. All of us have sinned. All of us have um, sinned against God. And we've fallen short of, of his glory. And there is nothing that we can do in and of ourselves to take care of our sin problem. It's only God that can intervene on our behalf. And that's the focus of those first three chapters. We are in need of God's grace and mercy, and we're in need of God's righteousness. That's how it's kind of broken up the first part. Then it goes on, and Paul explains that God has graciously provided salvation and a righteousness that comes from God, and it's based on faith in Christ alone. So God himself provided us the Savior that we need. He's the one who provides the righteousness that we need. And Jesus came and he died and he was a substitute for us. And Jesus paid the punishment that we deserve. He paid our ransom for us. And so Paul goes on and explains that in the shedding of Jesus' blood, the cross satisfied the just wrath of God against us. And Jesus' death on the cross was the only way for us to receive salvation. Jesus had to die for us to receive that forgiveness. It had to be the perfect sacrifice for sin once and for all. And that's exactly what Jesus did. So we are justified by faith in Jesus. That's that whole section, a couple chapters that Paul talks about. And it's all based on God's grace and mercy and the gift of salvation. 
And then from there, Paul explains that we are no longer slaves to sin, slaves to death, but we are made, we are made uh, brought to life because of Christ. And so we're called to be obedient and molded into the image of Jesus in every area of our lives. And that we're not doing this alone. We also have the gift of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, leading us, guiding us, convicting us, and redeeming us, making us more like Jesus. And so this all comes as a result of the grace and mercy. And that's exactly what Paul talks about in Romans 12, 1, right? I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. So as a result of that, that's the reason why. All those 11 chapters prior, that's the reason why, right? In view of God's mercy, then this is what we should do. The next one, this is our response, is that we should offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, and this is our true and proper worship. So when we look at Romans 12, 1 through 2, there's three action points, basically, that comes as a result. We see that Paul tells us to offer, so offer our bodies. We're, not, we're supposed to not conform to the world around us. And then we're supposed to be transformed by the renewing of our mind and the Holy Spirit working within us. So this first thing we're going to look at, we're called to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. It's important to understand what a living sacrifice means. You see, because in the Old Testament, a sacrifice was given as an atonement for sin. But here in the New Testament, Jesus already was the perfect sacrifice. He paid the ultimate price to pay for the price of sin once and for all. So this living sacrifice has nothing to do with the Old Testament sacrificial system um, that was done for the forgiveness of sin because Jesus already completed that. And so what we see here, as far as the living sacrifice, we look at the end of verse 1, and we kind of see an explanation. It says that um, the, our living sacrifice is described as our proper worship, our proper worship. So the word worship here can also mean ministry or service. How we live our lives is to honor and glorify God. So we can understand the word sacrifice here too in the New Testament as a service or offering to God. We're offering our life. Everything that we do is to brought, just to bring honor and glory to God. And uh, we see that Paul kind of goes and explains it a little bit more in Philippians 4.18. Um, Paul describes gifts that were given to him from the Philippian uh, people, Philippian church, and he receives these gifts as a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. So by, by, by serving Paul, these Philippian people were meeting his needs, and they were honoring and serving God through it too, and it pleased him. And it was an act of obedience and worship to God as they served and, and helped Paul. And, and this idea of, of God being pleased with us is similar to a parent's relationship with uh, their child, right? When you have your child and you see your kid you know, being kind to someone, helping others, wanting to jump in and serve. You know, we, we have our, our fall serve days um, and spring serve days in the youth ministry, and we see kids, 30, 40 kids coming together to go to serve in different ministries um, in our area, to go and help out different residents with raking the leaves and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, they jump in. They have joy doing it. They, they love it. We have, you know, five or six different teams that go out and serve and it just makes you proud, you know, to know that these kids are giving up their Saturday to go and, and to, to help others, to honor um, God, and to go and to share love just by their simple actions. And so, you know, when we see that in uh, our kids, it brings us joy. And also we know that it brings joy to God. In that same way, when we serve, when we help others, when we live on purpose for God, it brings him satisfaction. It brings him um, joy, knowing that we're loving others and loving him and respecting him and what he's called us to do. So our motivation to serve others and to serve in the body of Christ comes from a desire to please God and to worship him through our service and through, through um, our, the way that we live our lives. And here's, here's the great news is that here at Cottonwood, there are so many ways for us to get involved and to, to serve. Um, you know, just uh, the, the, the fall ministries just started. And just on a Sunday morning, there are so many different teams, so many different people that are working and serving together. 
I think it t- typically takes about 30 to 40 people to have uh, the Sunday morning services run uh, well. And so we got people who are working in the nursery, who are you know, holding babies and taking care of them, those who are doing um, the uh, Walk With Me ministry. And we have Sunday school that just started last week for kids all the way up through middle school, happening between the services. We got the tech team, we got the worship team, we got the security team. Um, we got so many different people that are, that are working and getting involved. The hospitality team, welcoming, opening up doors, making sure coffee and refreshments are available, making sure people have a great experience as they come to church and learn about God, so they want to come back. So many people are involved, so many people are working. That's, that's just Sunday mornings. Then you look at during the week, and every week, every day of the week, it seems like there's something going on, right? We have cadets and gems on Monday nights. We have uh, middle school youth ministry on Wednesdays. We have high school ministry on Sunday nights. Um, we got men's and women's Bible studies. We have small groups meeting throughout the community. We have committees for literally everything in the church that are coming together to, uh, um, to you know, make plans and make sure that the church is working efficiently. There are those who serve on council. There are those who are on We Serve. There's Kids Hope. There's Donating to Love Inc. There's so many different places that we can go and serve. And there's Literally, para churches that uh, para uh, ministries that um, that reach out to us each week, want to know if we can join with them in ministry. There's more need than there are people sometimes willing to serve, and it's it's good. It's good to have the opportunity. We just got to jump and be willing to serve. And next week, Pastor Matt's going to head um, kind of a, a, a talk, or a, I guess you can call it a campaign, or whatever, for us to be able to get involved. And to serve, and we'll have a board out back in the foyer that has the list of all the different opportunities, the openings that we have, and needs that we have for serving, so that we can do it well as a church. But uh, you know, serving is more than just giving your time and energy. When we serve, oftentimes it's about um, you know you, you experience community in that. You develop some of your greatest friendships in spending time with other people and serving together because you're kind of in the trenches together, right? You're serving together, and I can you know all different ministries we see that. I mean, firsthand I see we see it in middle school and high school ministries. We have ten leaders for each ministry, and everybody's having a good time bonding, and we spend time outside of our serving. And it all comes as a result of spending time together, serving together, and then we encourage one another and enjoy those relationships. So community comes as a result of that. And so this idea of being a living sacrifice goes also beyond just service. Everything that we do in life, we do it to honor and glorify God. How we raise our families, how we do our work, how we serve, everything that we do we do it for the honor and glory of God. That's what it's called. That's what, it, that's what it means to be a living sacrifice. It's our spiritual act of worship. So then, from there, Paul goes on. As a result of God's grace and gift of salvation, we give our lives as a spiritual act of worship. And then verse 2, we're told to not, do not conform to the patterns of this world. And this is where we get into the more practical sense of of living out our faith and putting it into practice. Um, So because of our faith in Jesus, we then um, were brought out of this old life of sin and the ways of the world and death that the world offers. And we're brought into this new life of righteousness made alive with Christ and the promise of eternal life. And although we are uh, given the promise of eternal life in heaven, we're not there yet. So while we're still living here, the world um, is still, we're still vulnerable to the influences of the world. So Paul warns us and tells us to not conform to the pattern of this world. Focus on the things that have eternal value. Focus on the things of Scripture. And so this, this word conforming that we see, that do not conform to the pattern of the world, the word, word conforming means to mimic, to agree with, to walk in its ways. It means to be uh, influenced from the outside And then it makes its way inward. So we're being molded into something if we we fall into the influence of the world. And they run contrary to the ways of God. So the Bible tells us often, Jesus tells us that we can't serve two masters, right? There's either God's way or there's the world's way. 
And the world's way focuses on self, selfish ambition, selfish desires, by taking care of ourselves most importantly, and we become the idol of our life, most important thing, and it takes the place of God when we conform our ways to the world. And yet Jesus commands us to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, the greatest commandment. And so this is why Paul urges us and tells us, do not conform, do not um, fall into the ways of the world. But then he said, instead, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So instead of being conformed, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And this uh, word transformed is the opposite of conformed. Conformed is out, outward working its way in. And this uh, word transformed is working from the inside out. It's this metamorphosis. It's this change that takes place on the inside. It's an inside transformation. And so we're being transformed by the renewing of our mind. It's the constant saturation of the word of God and we're living it out in our life and the Holy Spirit helps us to understand the word and to apply it to our life and to live it out. And it, so it works on the inside and then as a result of being transformed, as a, as a result of knowing these theological truths, as a result of the Holy Spirit working in our lives, working in our hearts, as we spend time in scripture, we're being conformed or being, we're being transformed from the inside out. The Holy Spirit's working inside, and as a result, our works and how we live our lives comes as a result of knowing those truths, knowing that why. We see that in 2 Corinthians 3.18. It says, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with, e with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So as we spend time contemplating the Lord's glory, discovering who he is, growing in our relationship with him, learning about his grace and the, the extent that he went to give us salvation, when we spend time looking at those things, then as a result, there's a transformation that takes place on the inside and works its way out. Then as a result of being transformed, we see the fruits of the spirit in our everyday life, in our attitude, how we treat others, how we live our life. And so God is the one who's doing the transforming. It's not about trying to be obedient to a list. It's about being obedient to a God who loves you and understanding his love. And you want, you're wanting to please him as a result of who God is. And so we see that the transformation comes when the people of God are using the word of God by the spirit of God to look like the son of God. I'll say it one more time. The transformation comes when the people of God are using the word of God by the spirit of God to look like the son of God. And that's our goal is to become more like Jesus. So God is the one who's doing the transforming. He's the one that's renewing our mind as we spend time in scripture and the Holy Spirit works in our hearts and our minds. So to summarize what we've talked about so far this morning, in light of God's grace and mercy and these theological truths that we see as a result of who God is, we dedicate our lives to him, all of us. In all that we do, we do it for the glory of God. We do it as a living sacrifice. Then we separate ourselves from the world so that it's not forming us into its own lifestyle. But instead, the third thing is we are transformed by the changing um, and the renewing of our mind by spending time in God's word. And so if you want to make this truth more powerful in your life, then understand the grace and the love of God more. So often we focus on the list of do's and don'ts and what we should do and shouldn't do. We focus on being ethical. And we focus in on what's most important, and that's focusing on a God who is for us, who loves us, who is perfect. Understanding God more will result in a changed lifestyle. The thing that will bring us, will motivate us and drive your obedience to God isn't a list. It's being transformed in the way you think and understand God. Now, if, you wanna, if you want to go deeper in your relationship with your spouse, her giving you or him giving you a list of things to do isn't going to help it, right? Although honeydew lists are amazing. My wife has a great one. 
She's got color coded and everything. But if I really want to go deeper in my relationship with my wife, that list doesn't mean anything. It's about spending time with her, getting to know who she is, discovering her character, the things that make her tick, that, that she really, really loves, and, and pursuing her. That's how I go deeper. And then as a result of loving her and knowing her, then I want to go do those things because I want to bring her happiness and joy. The same thing goes with our relationship with God. We pursue him. We discover his grace, his love. We discover how the extent he went for salvation for us. And then as a result of that comes the transformation. So pursue God, and then your life will be transformed from the inside out. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for those truths that we looked at today. We thank you for the gift of salvation that comes through faith in Jesus. But we know that our works are like filthy rags, and it's only through the, your righteousness and the leading of the Holy Spirit that we can honor you and glorify you. We pray, Lord, that we would submit our ways to yours. Convict us of the sin that we keep on that's reoccurring in our life. Convict us of the ways that we're living that we can submit to your will above our own. We pray, Lord, as we leave here this morning, Lord, we pray that we would fall in love with you, discover more about you and your character and who you are. And as we do that, we pray the Holy Spirit would transform us from the inside out. We look forward to seeing how you're going to work in us and through us as we honor and glorify you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.